good. Very good for a young lady, huh? Absolutely wonderful. Can I get this up? Thank you. There we go. Yeah. Well, good morning, church. Well, firstly, what I'd like to say is a very quick introduction. I am here, well, nothing is accidental with the Lord, of course, but I am here and it wasn't planned, but I was sharing some ideas with Betty outside a few weeks ago, and Reverend Martin was sitting close by over listening to what we were saying, and he said, you know, you need to preach in church, and that's how I found myself here. Now, one of the things I have said to myself is every opportunity that I have to share the word of God, I will no longer shy away from doing so. So much grace has been given to me. Uh, in terms of testimony, in terms of a quick introduction, I run a corporate training organization. I'm what you call an inspirational speaker and a corporate trainer. I do that internationally, and I've done that for many, many years. I've had the high privilege of spending time with some extremely senior people who have been able to give access or coaching advice to a, a fast track, accelerate their careers and their businesses. But I've also been acquainted with a lot of grief. I am somebody who has experienced a lot of pain in my life and a lot of failures in my life. But from all the pain, despondency, and failure, God has been able to lift me up, raise me from the dung, and position me to reign with princes. And only the Lord has done that. I'm forever submitted to his goodness in my life, to his grace that he's chosen me to do what I do, even with my flaws, even with my failures, even with my pain. He has refused to allow me. You guys normally see me coming to church. I sneak in and I sneak back out. But he has chosen to put me here by himself, and it's not my doing. But I think I have a few things I'd like to share with the church. One of the things I cannot stand in my life is anything to do with falsehood or falsity. Doesn't agree with me. I like order. I love order because God is a God of order. So today what I want to talk about real quick, I want to speak about building your life on the foundation of the rock of Jesus. There was a time when I spent so much time and energy fasting and I decided to go for seven days this time because I was seeking a breakthrough, as we say in Christianity. Breakthrough. Lord, you've got to answer me. And I spent seven days do you know what? It came to the seventh day of my fast. I still have not received no light from heaven, no massive revelation, and I began to really wonder. All this hassle of going without food, stressing, rolling on the floor, seeking the face of God, and here I am seven days after, still no word. Well, you know, God is faithful. As I began to read the last passages of my word for that day to close my fasting, Little word, little word, pop, pop ten. Believe my word. Do you know the whole entire seven days, all God showed me was go and believe what that word says. I'm not sharing it with my wife at that point. You know, all the seven days of awesome stress, all God has showed me is believe my word. So I made a decision to believe the word of God. And that is all I do. I'm also the kind of individual that likes to see power. When I mean power, I like to see the demonstration of God's power. Many a time I have conversations with him, Lord, but why? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why do you do that? You know, the Christian faith is a religion of power. It's none of the other fake religions. The Christian faith is the authentic, is the real business. And we will do better to believe it. God is able to show his might for the people who believe. And I want to challenge us a little bit today to go back to the 
basic fundamentals. You know, there are no new fundamentals. Fundamentals are fundamentals. Going back to the fundamentals and how we can begin to interpret and recognize what God is saying to us. I'll be speaking experientially from my own personal experiences and from what I've been taught by the Lord. So I've titled this Building Your Foundations on the Rock of Jesus. Satan was Job's troubler. He's also our troubler today. Could it be by chance that he's yet again stood before God and issued a great accusation against the last day's church to God? Saying, it is the last hour, God, but there is no evidence that you have a true church. You have no spotless bride. There are no wise virgins. In fact, most of them are asleep. Look at your church. Materialistic, complaining, too cool to suffer, bickering, backbiting, gossiping, self-centered babies, grasping for riches and the good life. Also, listen to many of their teachers and preachers telling them they need not suffer, that all things are theirs for the asking. Church, it will be a big lie for me to stand in front of you today and tell you and I as Christians that we will only observe sorrow Trouble, unemployment, divorce, illness, depression on all sides while we stand and purely observe in our cozy cocoon, not being touched or affected by what is happening out there. Our health will be attacked, our happiness will be attacked, and our wealth will be stripped equally. The Bible says God causes the rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. Equally, he causes the sun to rise on the good and the evil. We are not excluded from the suffering and the pain in the world. Job was holy, yet he suffered as holy as he was. We all know his story. The greatest evangelist who ever lived suffered more than anybody else you can imagine. We all know the story of the apostle Paul. He was acquainted with much sorrow and with much suffering. But Satan is also challenging God. Why don't you take down your wall of protection, God, and let me put your church to the test? <laughs> you won't even have a holy remnant left. I'll take away their employment. I'll smite them with sorrows. I'll pour out a spirit of fear and despondency and flood them with temptations. You will see this last pampered generation fold and crumple. There are no jobs left in your church. They are all spiritual whips. Now here's Satan positioning his accusations before God. Church, in the midst of our intense battles and trials, Many of us have adopted Job's despairing language. Our hearts cry out to God with the questions. Why has this happened to me? Why am I going through this? What have I done wrong to upset you? I love you so much, God. My heart is pure, as much as far as I know. My walk is holy. And I'm constantly longing after you. So why am I going through this? I guess that's the eternal question. Questions we all are pondering 
at one stage of our lives or the other. Pain. The human body is not used to pain. We don't like discomfort. We don't want to experience what a lot of us experience today. I look at the church and I see stories, 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 personal stories, personal battles. I'm old enough to know that as beautiful as you all look, <laughs> there's a lot going on inside. Okay? There's a lot going on inside. It's a human thing. As beautiful as you all look, most of us are so good. We do church so well. You know, we, we do everything. We never miss service. We do all this beautiful. God is not impressed by that. All right? Just to tell you now. Go to Isaiah chapter 66 and hear what God said at the beginning of that verse. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the rest you're going to give me? What is the house you're going to build me? Didn't my hand make them all? This is what I focus on. The person who has a contrite and a humble spirit, that person will see my favor. End up. You don't know what's going on inside of me right now. You can never see it. You can, you can guess, but you can never see it. God knows your heart. God knows what's going on inside of you, what you are plotting, what you are planning, who you are gossiping about, what, what, what your evil plans, only God knows them all. But in the next instant, you may be smiling and gorgeous and nice and happy. God is not fooled. He is looking at your heart. How clean is your heart? Do you have clean hands? Can you come before me with clean hands and a clean heart? It's what God wants to know. And that is the bottom line, not church. Saints, this is why Scripture said in Revelation 12, 12, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. That is the reason we are experiencing most of the challenges we are experiencing. Let's move on to Matthew chapter 7 verse 24. And I'll read very quickly because I don't have much time up here. This is a contrast between two builders or two professing Christians. Therefore, verse 24, Therefore whoever hears these sayings of mine, and does them. I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Verse 25. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Verse 26. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, they will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was that fall. Our Lord Jesus here is speaking in this well-known parable of the two house builders. One is wise and the other one is foolish. Both of them are building a house, which is an example of our lives. So both of them were building their lives. Every person has a house, a life to build. How we build our house will determine our destiny. Not just for this life on earth, but also for eternity. However, there is an important point I want to stress here. 
outwardly, these two persons look similar. There is no big difference in the kind of house they are building. Perhaps they use the same kind of material. Both houses seem nice and attractive, but inwardly, they are very different. The fundamental difference between them is the foundation on which they built their houses. However, you can't see the foundations because it is hidden. And guess what? The foundations are only revealed when a great storm comes. The house built on the rock will stand firm, while the one built on sand will be blown away. Even John the Baptist, who introduced Jesus to the world as the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sins of the world. John the Baptist introduced the Messiah as the Lamb of God. But when trials came, the same John the Baptist, who spoke by revelation of Christ being the, the, the Lamb of God, guess what? He sent messages to inquire. Is that really the Christ? Or should we expect another? Because his hope was disappointed. Because he thought when Christ came, all the problems will be over. As he was embattling different trials, he began to doubt himself, the forerunner of Jesus. Should we expect another? Or are you the real deal? Paraphrasing. It's what really what he was expecting. Let alone you and I. Testing comes. Tests our faith. Challenges our beliefs to the foundations. And it will shake us. I have a very close friend right now. A recent acquaintance of about one year standing. But we've become so close. This man is probably worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Spectacularly wealthy. God positioned me in his life like a Joseph. And I began to see, a Muslim gentleman, I began to see recently the workings of God, how God operates. Okay? This chap has a small challenge at the moment that has affected his mobility. He's tried to use money. He's um, acting as an advisor to him. He's tried to buy his way out of all kinds of situations. And I smiled. And I said to him, your wealth cannot see you through this one. Your wealth cannot, because he thought he could buy himself out of anything. And many times I've repeated to him, your chariots and your horses, no matter how swift, cannot help you at this time. I said, what do you mean? I said, you need to bow to the Lordship of Jesus. Because when God is amazing, because he creates the problems most of the time, and creates a solution. Listen, no matter which business school you went to today, they could never teach you and I a strategy of getting Pharaoh to dream and have the answer ready in a Joseph. Which business school is going to teach you? Is it blue water strategy? Blue, which strategy are you going to be taught that will tell you that will make Pharaoh dream the night he dreamt? And the answer to that dream has already been provided by God. That he took somebody from captivity, locked up for no good reason, innocent man, and locked up for years. One day, God decided his captivity was over and got him to be able to interpret the dream of the king, of Pharaoh. And instantly, he was positioned to the highest place in the land, only below Pharaoh. But there are some lessons in there. Christians have a way of saying all the time, all things work together for good. That's an incomplete statement. It's not true. Oh, well, you know, all things work together for good. Well, you know, no, it doesn't. 
all things work together for good for those who love God and for those who have been called according to purpose. Let's get it right. Not everybody will have everything worked for good for them. Are you hearing me? God says the person who everything is going to work together for good for, there are two caveats. One, you love God. Two, he has called you according to purpose. Predestined you before the foundations of the world with a purpose. This is the reason that all things have to work together for your good because it is God's purpose. Nothing will thwart his purpose for you in your life. So he causes the lemons to become lemonade. He causes the problems to work together for his good so that his purpose in your life will be revealed. Everybody here. So all things don't work together for you. Let's get it right. If Joseph had been in jail and he harbored enmity in his heart against God and was angry at God, it will not have worked together for his good. Pharaoh might have given him his freedom and say, here's a few uh, 50 pounds, go start a new life. You're free. The reason it worked together for good was Joseph loved God. So God could turn his adversity into his mountain place. Everybody here. Let's get the lessons. Let's understand what he's trying to teach us here. Okay. Now, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, For he has made everything beautiful in its own time. I'm a witness to that. If I had time, I could tell you stories that will blow your mind. I have not come here willingly. <laughs> I've been dragged by the scruff of my neck to bow before Jesus. I'll just tell you the truth now. I have spent fortunes on my mental development, on my personal development. I've traveled to different courses internationally to become the best I could be in problem solving, in articulation, in persuasive words of human language. I've done all those things for years. And I came to God, I lost everything. Bankrupt at 27, began to build my life again, fell again. Listen, I could tell you stories that would make you cry for me. But I don't have the time for that now. What I can tell you is that I was dragged by the scruff of my neck to bow. And I have to bow. And I have bowed to the Lordship of Jesus. I have even been amazed at his grace and what he's been teaching me so that I will know he is sovereign and he is my Lord. <laughs> you don't have to persuade me. I'm there already. I, I, I know it for myself. Okay? I know who this God is. He said, for he has planted eternity in the hearts and minds of men. A divinely implanted sense of purpose working through the ages which nothing under the sun but God alone can satisfy. I said to God lots of times, Father, why this beautiful specimen of human beings that you've created? Why would you create such amazing specimen, phenomenal beings, and allow them 80, 90, 100, they're gone? I said, it don't make sense. For he has planted eternity in the hearts of men. There is something inside your heart that has a recognition that there is more than this materiality, than this physical dimension that we see. You have stirrings inside of you that tells you there's much more. Isn't it? You know there is much more than meets the eye. You know you are much more than you're experiencing at the moment. He allows that to happen. So we know when this particular age, this our period, this our sojourn, fleeting and transitory, time right here on earth is over, that we are going to live somewhere else. We know it. We know there has to be more than what we see at the moment. And it is true. And God made that so I have this stirrings of an invisible life, a dimension of power, never before been seen by anybody 
because what you challenge God for, when I mean challenge in a true sense, he grants. Long as you don't want him to scratch every intellectual itch that you have, if you're seeking to know, he will show you. Because he wants to disciple you. He wants to train you so you can edify others. So he will show you. So Hebrews 11.6 tells us for anything to happen you have to believe first that he is God. Now think about this carefully. You see, the reason I do this I train and teach for a living. So I know people. All right? They do this, but they're not thinking about it. Okay? God wants you to know He is God. And He says, I'll only reward you if you agree and believe I am God and you seek me accordingly. Isn't it? That He is God. Establish that fact. He is God. Don't confuse Him with anybody else. Don't confuse him with other religions and other deities. Don't join other people. Don't do all this touch wood business. So many Christians I see telling me touch wood. Do you know that is, what is that? Touch wood? That's superstitious. You join in the language of the culture and you find yourself using words that you should not be using. The amount of people Christians tell me touch wood. Uh, and do all the signs for me. I said, are you a Christian? He said, yes. Why are you doing that to me? Oh, <laughs> you know the way? The culture has swallowed them in. If you're doing touch wood, stop it. You don't touch wood. You touch Jesus. We don't touch wood. Psalm 127 declared, exuberantly. David declared, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When my enemies and my foes, when they came to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. When an army came against me, my heart was not moved. Even with war, breaks out around me. In this, I will be confident. I said, but Lord, how do you get to a place where an army comes against you and your heart is not moved? You've got to ask these questions. How do you get to a place where war breaks out around you, your heart, you are confident? Lord, how can you get to such a place of power and you're not moved? And you follow through the train of the thoughts of the rest of that uh, chapter to the end. And it's one of my greatest verses. Lord, what would I have done if I did not believe that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? What would I have done? Which hope would I have had? How would I have, have been able to endure? perform, achieve, survive. If I did not believe that I will see the Lord's goodness in this land of the living, not when I'm dead, right here and there. Psalm 144 says, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers to fight battle, my love and kindness, my deliverer, my shield, my high tower, my fortress, the one who subdues my enemy. Listen, guys, we got to exalt the Lord, his kingship and his lordship. No matter what that situation is, let's repeat and say it to ourselves when we go through these challenges. Romans 8, 11 says, but if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, if that spirit indwells you, surely he can give life or power to your mortal bodies. Do you believe that? Do you believe the power that created the sun, the moon, and placed it billions of galaxies, the oceans, the marine world, the trees, 
the forest, humans, animals, birds, myriads of dollars. The power that created it is lying inside of you, waiting for you to ignite it. It's your job to ignite it. Not his job. It will just be there, wait. Until you call on it and pull it. Many a times I've said to the Lord, Father, I refuse a mediocre life. I refuse to live a mediocre life. Because I'm a prince from heaven. I'm a God on this earth. That's what scripture says. A prince of heaven. I said, I cannot live like this. I can't operate like this. I'm a prince from heaven. That's what you said. Your word says in John 10, 10 that... Jesus Christ said, I have come. The devil has come, but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I have come to give you life, but in abundance. Is that what he said? He said, I didn't come to give you life in little bits. He said, in abundance. Only those who call upon that will receive it. Because he's waiting for you to call on that awesome power inside of you. Ephesians 3.20 says to us that for he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. Another caveat again. But according to the power that is at work within us. Church, how great is the power that's at work within you? Because it can only do exceeding abundantly above based on the power that is working inside of you. How big have you made the power or how small have you made the power? Because you're responsible. If you think that power within you is a power that will give you the earth, then that is the kind of power you receive. If you think it's a small power that will just help you to be able to get out of bed in the morning, that is the power you're going to receive. Which power are you calling on? According to his power that is at work within you. It's what scripture says. He says he's able to. So there is no uh, there is no discussion about that anymore. We know he's, he's able to. Is that what he said? He said he's able to. But according, are you following me? He's able to, but he's not going to do it. But you and I know he's able to. The only time he does it is when you activate that power. Then you begin to see it manifest in your life. Just like the story you told when you were going to Letton Hall, uh, Madam, in here, and I was smiling at how it all came together, right? When you call upon him, he shows up. One of my favorite verses, first, uh, John 5, 4, I first discovered this when I had a huge tax bill. And it frightened me. You know how I was going to pay for this tax bill. You know how it is with, you know, uh, you spent the money and you hope your accountant can be extremely creative and then they still ended up with a bill that was not too creative. So I thought, how are we going <laughs> to pay for this? Then it, became, it, 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 it was getting serious. They were writing and they were threatening to, uh, what's the word, to, uh, these guys, are, they're mean. I mean, they're nicer now. <laughs> and they're nicer now. They talk to you. They want to counsel. They want to discuss. They want to give you time. They're, there's a human face to them now. <laughs> In the past, they, 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 they told me, well, you to take you out of business. I took the tax bill, the letter, I put it on the floor. Listen, I want to show you, <laughs> I told you if I had time, <laughs> how you activate the power. The God you serve is an awesome God. All right? 1 John 5, 4 says, whoever has been born of the Spirit of God has overcome the world. Listen, just please, Listen, whoever has been born of the Spirit of God, that's the second birth, has overcome the world, not will, has overcome the world. 
This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So we activate our faith, and we use our faith to overcome the world. I put the letter on the floor, I stood on it. 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning, Sunday midnight, where I do my battles. I put it on the floor, and I said, you are nothing. I stood on top of it, and I began to declare. This is all, this is spiritual war. I began to say, you are nothing. You are nothing. Well, the long and short of it is that from nearly 19 and a half thousand pounds, I ended up paying about just under 600 pounds. I have just told you I can tell you stories. You either believe in the power you've got or you don't believe in the power you've got. You've been giving power over life situations. Only if you call upon it, you begin to see it go to work. So, some of my closing thoughts. Just as God brought Job out of his affliction, so he will bring you and I out of every affliction and every fire. Big, I didn't hear a man in this side. You don't want to be brought out of your... Uh, of your right? Thank you, sir. Because he has said, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But he does what? Delivers him from them all. He didn't say you wouldn't have afflictions. He said he would deliver you from all of them if you call upon him. We do not realize how important it is to God that we trust him through all the floods of trouble that come upon us from hell. You see, the devil cannot touch you or test you unless God first lets down the wall. So whatever you are going through, <laughs> the wall has been let down for it to happen to you. Because God needs to know whether you are really his and you trust and believe in him. The devil cannot touch you without the wall around you being let down. You need to know that. He cannot touch you. Colossians 2.10 says that Jesus Christ is the head of all principalities and powers. The day I discovered this, I couldn't believe it. I said, devil, you mean all this hassle, harassment you give to people? Oh, <laughs> Jesus is your head. What's my problem? <gasps> the day I discovered it was like Christmas, I'm telling you. I began to say to the head, I said, you can do nothing unless God allows. It cannot happen. What is that supposed to do? Strengthen our faith. When you are in deep trouble, give you two contrasts, contrasting situations. You are in deep trouble right now and you're having the time of your life on holiday. Those two scenarios, which one forces you to seek God more? <laughs> you think God doesn't know that? Oh, all right, see. Listen, when I'm loaded up, all right, I know even though I still do what I have to do, Reverend Greg, I still do what I have to do. You know, I still pray, I still... I don't have the same zeal in pursuing God than when I'm in trouble. When I'm in trouble, <laughs> I'm the best kid of God you can find because I want that fire taken away. You think God doesn't know that? He knows that. So when this wall is let down, press in. Discover the lessons. Find out what God wants to show you. He creates the problems. He creates the solution. He says, I, God, do them both. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There has no temptation overtaking you except what is common to mankind. Nothing has happened to you and I that is not normal. 
But he says, God is faithful. He will not allow us to be tempted beyond that which we are able to handle. Because with all of those problems, trials, adversities, whatever you want to call them, he creates a way for you and I to escape it. And yes, he does. I can tell you that a million times. Yes, he does that. You see, your trials, your adversities, your problems, these are not contradistinctive or antithetical to taking you to your place of power. As a matter of fact, your trials and adversities are prerequisites to taking you to the mountain top. So the thing we cry about and scream about, we actually need to usher us in to our place of positioning and power. What we have to do essentially is to renew our minds to understand the reasons. And by the way, as we start asking deep questions of God, we begin to have an idea. I'll tell you something quite funny. One time, I was in my car saying to uh, God, uh, you know, conversations I was having with him. I said, you know, Lord, look at uh, Solomon, look at uh, David. I said, it's not fair. David, look at how many wives they had and how many women they had. And uh, in the new dispensation, you jump on the people instantly, before they thought even landed. You know what the Lord said to me? Instantly. He said, do you want to live under that dispensation or under grace? Like that. God... <laughs> Would you want to live like that? Or would you want to go through the Ten Commandments? Would you want to go through the laws? Can you go through the laws? He said, or would you rather plead the blood of Jesus and his saving grace? Which would instantly. When you ask questions of God, he gives you the answers. Isn't it? So I want to encourage us today and say, whatever we are going through, let us remain founded on the rock of Jesus. Who will see us through each and every single problem if we will believe he has heard us and if we believe that he will act on our behalf. You will see his power work in your life every time. Here's how we need to start looking at things sometimes. Saints, there is always a solution. The problems or the challenges might blind us from seeing the solution, but there's always a solution. You remember the lady when Abraham's maid, um, Sarah's maid, when it was sent out with uh, Ishmael, uh, sent on a donkey with bread and water and sent into the desert. And that was one of the things that really broke my heart. And I said to the Lord, I said, Father, I'm very unhappy about this. This is not a good story. Why on earth would you do that? Why would you do that? Why would you allow Abraham? Was it the maid's fault? It was Sarah that said, go sleep with my maid, you know, have a child. I said, but why would you send her out? Because the scripture says the Lord told Abraham, listen to your wife. Isn't that right? And she was crying. Crying in the desert. Kept her son away, thinking that child might die crying in the desert. And the Lord, sh did the Lord show her the pool of water? It was there all the time. She could not see. You and I cannot see when we are engulfed in our problems. But here's what I can tell you. There is always a solution. Raise your head up and say, Father, I know you have provided a solution. Where is it? Such Search, 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 listen out, search, read, listen to people, search. There is a solution. He will send an answer. But our problems engulfs us and blinds us that we don't see it. But it is there. Let us give God praise. Let us exalt his name. Let us declare his power. Let us declare the supremacy of Jesus Christ, his lordship over the entire earth. Father, we honor and glorify you. We bow before your throne. We adore you and we declare you as king forevermore. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, church.
you, Charles? Ah, there we go. <laughs>